Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Watchman Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli military and security practitioners and experts. And our guest today is Brigadier General Daron Gavish, retired from the career corps, but uh, very active uh, in the reserve. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here, Amir. Thank you. You were the uh, chief of the Air Defense Forces uh, for the IDF. And the one should note that contrary to uh, what is uh, the habit in uh, some other military organizations, in the IDF, air defense is part of the Israel Air Force. And uh, again, uh, in the US uh, military, uh, just like Army aviation, air defense is part of the US Army. Mm -hmm. In Israel, it's part of the Air Force. What are the advantages of this uh, system? Of the, of the, you mean the idea of being part, as part of the, of the Air Force? Well, I must say that uh, we, it, we didn't start in the Air Force. The beginning was in uh, around 48, and uh, the, the Israeli air defense uh, was part of the artillery because that was really the concept uh, around the world, that uh, air defense is part of, uh, of the artil artillery. At, at the time, Israel also had coast artillery waiting for an invasion from the sea, but it never happened. Exactly. And by the way, I, I must say that the first interception uh, was done by the Israeli air defense. Uh, there were uh, four Spitfires, Egyptian four uh, Spitfires, that came to attack Zdedov, which is in Tel Aviv, and the third one was, uh, was intercepted by an Israeli air defense uh, uh, guy. I, I always uh, like to say it next to my uh, friends in the Air Force, but, but this, is, this is the reality. But it was a gun, not and a missile. It, it was a gun. It was a gun. Back then it was a gun, of course. And, uh, but, but going back to your question, so this is how it started. In uh, 67, uh, that was the first missiles, serious, I would say, missiles that uh, were uh, uh, introduced into the, the defense of Israel, and this were, those were the Hawk system. And uh, then there was a decision made by Ezra Weitzman, uh, who said, uh, if we are shooting into the air, everything which is happening in the air should be part of the, um, uh, of the Air Force. So should be, I would say, um, the Air Force have to look on, on, this, on this sphere of the air, and everything that is happening there should be his uh, responsibility. So just to and expand on the, mm -hmm. on the issue that you ch touched on, uh, the HAWK, which is an acronym for uh, Homing All-Way Killer, was um, one of the first uh, US-made air defense uh, systems. And um, Prime Minister Ben-Gurion asked for it uh, several times until the Kennedy administration authorized it. And one of the reasons, which was not known at the time, was that he wanted to protect the nuclear reactor at Dimona, in addition to Air Force bases and population centers. Yeah, that's, that's, a, it's, that's a great point. And, uh, and, and you're also right that I believe it was really the, the first serious system that came from the US. I mean, that was the transaction time, six, around 68, from the French-made Air Force uh, uh, airplanes that were part of our Air Force uh, to, the, to the really to the US uh, system. So, so yes, the Hawk was part of it. So when the Hawk came, he, he became part of the Air Force. And then on 71, four, four years later, it, there was a decision that all the uh, the air defense is going to be part of the air the force. L seventy gun, L seventy, and, and others twenty three millimeters. And but the idea is that, uh, and this is the advantage uh, that uh, whatever is happening on the air, is the air force is looking at it. Uh, the air force is, con is controlling the air. The air force is fighting in the air. So if you fight either with airplanes or with missiles, you are basically uh, intercepting uh, enemies' airplanes. So someone have to look at it from a centralized uh, point of view, and, and there is a lot of advantages of it. And I'm not talking about the advantage of being part of the Air Force. It's, uh, you, have, you have usually better food and better facilities, and this is also a, a big advantage. So Israel, um, again, contrary to what is happening in the US military, the US military, of course, has global obligations exactly. and uh, is operating through theaters, European exactly. Command, Pacific Command, and the Air Force chief is not there. He is in the Pentagon uh, near Washington, and um, he has to equip and train the force. But in the Israeli system, mm -hmm. the Air Force chief 
is the centralized commander of what you talked about. And mm -hmm. he has to control his planes as well as his uh, missiles. Yeah. So, so you have to coordinate your missions with the flying air force. Exactly. This is, this is exactly how it works. And, you know, we, we, we like to compare ourselves to the U.S., but I always tell to my U.S. friends that uh, in size, you know, you could take Israel, put it into Michigan Lake, and we will sink. So the, 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 this is a, su a superpower, and what works for them works for them. And, and by the way, I could also tell you, because I'm during my reserve, I'm, I'm working very closely with, with my U.S. friends, is that they have this system of a joint task force. And, 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 and you feel, I mean, they would, uh, you feel the professionalism and the way that they are working because you see guys, uh, some of the mission is being done by Navy, some of it by Army, Air Force. But when it's a task force, they really train to work together. So from our point of view, we don't really see the difference if, it came, if they are coming from the Air Force or for, for the Navy. The, the comparable organization to the IDF is probably the Marine Corps, where they have an air ground uh, task force as the basic. Uh, I agree, because in the Marine, you have the, the full components. I mean, so it's kind of a, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a good example. So you uh, joined the um, Israeli Defense Forces uh, at 18, probably. Uh, yeah. And wh why uh, go to the, um, uh, what was uh, then? Uh, the air defense. Air defense. <laughs> in, in the early 80s? In the early 80s. And uh, well, the story was I started in the, and it's like, it, there is a joke about it, by the way. The, the, the story is that I started in the pilot course. And in some point, we decided that uh, it's better that, we'll, that I will be on the ground other than. A mutual the, decision of the Air Force. Exactly. And a mutual decision. They, they told me, you know, grow up for a year, you could come in one year. And then uh, there is this, uh, uh, this saying in Israel that uh, if, uh, if I'm not going to fly, no one is going to fly and I'm going to kill it. So you go to the air defense. And, uh, but for me, it was really something that uh, I, wa I wanted uh, to fill the ground. I wanted to be deployed with forces. Uh, that was something that was interesting for me. And also the air defense brings with them uh, interesting, I would say, uh, uh, combination between technology because there is a lot of technology there. Back then it wasn't as it is now, because today it's amazing technology. But still there was technology in one hand and being fighter from the other hand. And, and, and this combination was attractive uh, from my point of view, and this is why I found myself there. But you know, there is some contradiction in the Israeli Air Force, uh, because it is a very advanced um, uh, leading edge in, in most uh, of its uh, dimensions. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you go to its uh, organizational culture, it is very conservative and even reactionary. You must be a pilot and preferably a fighter pilot. And there is a hierarchy uh, because there are navigators and helicopter pilots mm -hmm. and transport pilots. But you must wear your wings in order to be part of the leading group. Mm -hmm. So is it uh, worth your while as an ambitious young officer to stay in the Air Force rather than go to the infantry or armor or artillery where you could uh, have advanced uh, much faster? Yeah, I'm, I'm fully aware of this uh, culture aspect and, and so on. But to tell you the truth, I, I never felt it. I, mean, I never felt as a young officer that there is something uh, different uh, uh, and may maybe one of the reasons for it is that even, by the way, also today, the, the Air Force understand that there is some uniqueness, uh, which is um, uh, when you're looking on the air defense, there is some, some uniqueness and some capabilities which are there, are the, the air defense uh, uniqueness. And, and they understand that, uh, you know, we should work together. It's, it's the same force, really. I mean, we, we, we are blue. Uh, there, there is, today, it's, it's a non-issue. It, maybe it was in the past, but, but for sure today is a non-issue. But it, for myself, I, from day one, I felt that I'm part of the Air Force, uh, of the ground forces of the Israeli Air Force. I felt that uh, my mission is very important to, for the defense of Israel. Uh, I was defending an uh, important site in the south part of Israel, uh, deployed with my uh, battery. And, uh, and the other thing which is very attractive, I would say, for, for a young guy is that... Uh, 
and, and this is something that in the Air Force, it will take time till you get to this point, is that uh, as a young captain, you are already commanding a battery. You are in charge of uh, more than 80 people. Some of them are enlisted. Some of them are, are career um, uh, NCOs and, and officers. And uh, you really feel that you are doing something important. This, uh, is, this, is, uh, this is a very salient point because uh, in the Air Force, and this is a point which ground forces officers always put against the Air Force when an Air Force general wants to be the chief of the general staff, that in the Air Force, only when you are a lieutenant colonel and you get command of a squadron, you really start to command. While in the ground forces, as well as in the air defense, you command a, bl a platoon, a battery, a battalion, and a brigade or a wing, mm -hmm. as, as uh, is in your case. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so for me, again, once, once again, to be a captain and to be a commanding of, of, a, of, a, of a battery, that was something which was uh, very, very appealing. And uh, by the way, about, about the, the, the Air Force, the, the Air Force have its way to, uh, to command, but you know, we, almost mu we must remember that there is some command elements in the air. I mean, when you are com as, a, as a captain or as a major, when you are uh, commanding a mission, still you have, uh, you have airplanes around you, you have people that you are commanding, so you're right that you're commanding a squadron, but the commanding element is still there from... When you fly information. When you fly informations and uh, when you do your missions. So there is a commanding element also in the Air Force, that's for sure. But that's really on, on a mission. Uh, exactly, mission-based. Uh, yeah, you don't, you don't uh, train or grow your, your forces and you command officers mostly in the air. You're so right. it's different than, than uh, yeah. being in command of uh, enlisted uh, men. Now, um, the Air Force chief in Israel is a major general. Mm -hmm. Usually he's junior to his uh, counterparts, to his opposite numbers from other Air Forces uh, who are amazed to see mm -hmm. that uh, this officer uh, who is in charge of uh, the uh, Israeli Air Force is only a two-star. Yeah. You were a one-star, a brigadier general, and what, one of 10 or dozen officers in the Air Force Chief's command group, his key staff officers, mm -hmm. um, commanders of uh, larger bases, mm -hmm. and yourself? Yeah. Well, yes, th this is something that we, we could say um, it's, it's right for the Air Force, but it's right for the, for the IDF as all. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are quite, um, I would say, humble in, in the amount of stars that uh, we provide our officers. And uh, I, I could see it, um, you know, when I met uh, uh, my counterparts uh, from the U.S., from France, or from other nations. Uh, for example, in France, they start with two stars. There is no one star. Uh, with the U.S., um, they start with one star, but they, but they go quite quickly to the second and the, to the third uh, star. But I can tell you that, you know, when we meet um, with, with the generals from, from other countries, they don't look at the numbers of the stars. They really look on the mission. What is, what is exactly that you are doing? Uh, what are your responsibilities? And, and we could find equivalent, uh, <coughs> I would say, uh, counterparts, which could be two stars or, or three stars. Uh, everyone understands uh, what, is, what, is, what are exactly their responsibilities. And uh, so, um, yeah, you know, there, there, was a to there was a discussion back, um, back in the history. I'm not sure that it's, it, it happens again about the amount of stars that we have, but uh, it's, it's, it's okay. So I'm uh, okay with my one star. <laughs> so uh, you are there in the uh, early, mid-1980s, uh, and there are several missions uh, for the air defense forces. Um, mm -hmm. Defend your air bases so that uh, the... Uh, planes, the fighters uh, could take off and land, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, defend uh, perhaps the mobilization system so that the reserves, the reserves are, as you know, some, some three-fourths mm -hmm. or two-thirds of yeah. the ground forces uh, in war, and also go ahead with the troops mm -hmm. uh, when you are in a ground war such as is Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, Vulcan guns uh, and the like. What was your impression back then in the mid-1980s of uh, what your task as an air defense officer would be? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question because it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how things evolve. But going back to those years, 
Uh, you, you're completely right. Uh, the idea was close support to the ground forces, uh, whatever they are. And uh, Lebanon is, is a great um, uh, story uh, if, if, we talk, if, we, if we look at it from, from this angle. And uh, by the way, you know, the first, uh, vehicle, the, ve the first military vehicle that went into Beirut was a Vulcan. Uh, with direct fire with against With direct against fires, yes. And they, and they even got a kind of a recognition for what they've done. And uh, so back then we used, we used because we had, we had guns, so we used two guns against the air, but also uh, we could use it, um, you know, like as a flat, a flat gun. Uh, what is what is called in a professional uh, terms. So uh, so this is this was one of the mission. The other the other mission was uh, the the idea of drones started back then. Not drones like today. Uh, it was uh, manned, uh, droned, and all kind of uh, missions like this that the terrorists were trying to uh, penetrate uh, uh, Israel, and this is the way that they were using. So we were also defending against this. Also gliders. Gliders, exactly, and uh, and and of course a classic air defense against uh, airplanes. Uh, the most known, um, I would say, interception uh, happened in uh, 82 when a MiG-25 was flying very, very high in the in the sky. And a Syrian a, one. A Syrian one uh, was taking pictures of the Israeli deployment, and uh, it was very challenging to intercept him because it was uh, so high. So uh, we um, um, uh, we deployed a, a Hawk battery into uh, Lebanon to a very high uh, place over there. And uh, we shot uh, a missile. Uh, the the F uh, the MiG-25 went down, and then F-15 came and uh, finished the job. Uh, so otherwise, there wouldn't have been range if you were not up on a exactly on a hill or yeah. a mountain. Because back then, those was I mean, it's complete again. It's a completely different story today. But back then, yes, this is we we need to be very innovative. So, but, but you know, uh, going yes. back because uh, you know the legacy of the Air Defense Forces, uh, whatever happened before uh, you joined and even before you were born, um, two uh, particular intercepts uh, come to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, one was in 1967 when your forces were ordered to uh, shoot an Israeli Uragan mm -hmm. uh, plane uh, over Dimona because the pilot was already badly wounded and probably unconscious. Mm -hmm. So um, you probably have a protocol for such uh, mm -hmm. occasions. Yeah. And the other event was on October the 5th, 1973, a day before the Yom Kippur war started, when an Egyptian plane penetrated the airspace over Sinai, but the intercept failed. Uh, the officer mm -hmm. uh, apparently uh, tried to launch, but nothing happened. It, it could have changed the entire course of, uh, of the war yeah. because obviously uh, the Israeli forces uh, would have been on alert following uh, yeah. such an event. Well, the, you know, it's part, it's part of the history, and uh, you're right. I mean, those, those are two events which are uh, important in the, in the history. There are, there are other events. Uh, for example, the first interception in 73 was done uh, by a Hawk battery in the northern part of uh, Israel. Well, Hawk is, the Hawk system and, and all the other air defense systems are, are part of, of, of the of Israel uh, Air Force uh, legacy. And uh, by the way, there are more, uh, there are around 100, a bit less uh, interceptions, which, has, which, are, uh, which are, have been uh, done by the Israeli air defense. Do you have aces in the air defense forces? Of course, uh, a fighter, Mm -hmm. Pilot uh, is considered an ace after five yeah. uh, intercepts. Do you have similar recognition uh, medals or whatever? For uh, we have medals for the ones that intercept the uh, airplanes. Uh, we don't really call them aces because it's not a one guy effort. It's a group effort. It's a group effort. It's a, it's a team uh, mission. So it's a it's a bunch of uh, people which are part of the engagement control uh, system. Uh, so center. So it's not that we're looking at it as one guy that did it. We, we look at it as a teamwork. And uh, But yes, there are good teams and, uh, that we know that did a great job. And, and mainly, I mean, in, and lately it's, it's quite amazing to see the amount of interceptions. Uh, General, <coughs> General Gavish, um, in a, the second part of our conversation, uh, we'll get closer to the present. Mm -hmm. But um, another event comes to mind, a tragic one. 
And that is from the so-called War of Attrition of 1969-1970 mm -hmm. between Israel and Egypt, when a Hawk battery shot down by mistake an Israeli uh, light plane. And the question is, um, this was, of course, uh, more than 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you have an IFF and uh, friend or foe uh, system now in order to avoid such mishaps? Mm -hmm. Again, that's a good point because uh, this is exactly the reason why air defense must be part, part of the Air Force because everything should be controlled by the Air Force. Air Force the Air Force knows where is our airplanes, who is going to shoot at him, and, and so on. Uh, so there are uh, uh, procedures uh, which are exactly for, for those uh, situations. Uh, back then, the means were completely different from what we have today. So, you know, there is no comparison. But if we go to, to those times, uh, there was some lacking of IFF uh, systems, as you said, and the control was not as tight as it is uh, today, and things like this could occur. It didn't happen a lot, because, you know, we're talking about something that happened 50 years ago, and it was the only time that something like this happened. But, but for sure, this is something uh, that we all the time looked at. We make sure that uh, we don't want to hit uh, our uh, Air Force um, airplanes. I, I mean, this is something that we, you would never uh, want it to happen. So this is something that is being always looked carefully. And uh, we learned al also from, from this uh, history. There is also a problem with civil aviation, uh, especially after 9-11, the mm -hmm. so-called World Trade contingency, in which when you see an airliner, which uh, was probably hijacked, mm -hmm. trying uh, to get closer to Tel Aviv or to other centers, and you have only 10 minutes or less to intercept. Uh, obviously, part of the uh, system is uh, sending fighter planes uh, to intercept. Mm -hmm. But is the air defense also involved in it? Yes, of course. Um, the air defense is involved in every mission. And so this is also one of the of the missions that the air force is uh, uh, the air defense is involved at. Um, but I, I, you know, I could say in general that, uh, and and we're going back to your your previous question, why we are part of the air force. We look at it as a combined mission. It, we don't see, look at the mission, not today and not in the past, by the way. We don't look at the mission as a air defense mission or air force uh, airplanes uh, mission. It's a combined mission. Uh, we have the, the, the airplanes from one hand, we have the air defense from the other hand. The one that is most uh, efficient at this point to intercept, he would be the one that would be uh, shooting down uh, the target. And, and we saw it in recent times. I mean, the drones that were shot down, some of them by the air defense, some of them by the, airplanes, air, air, the, the air force airplanes, but they, they were always there together. This is a lesson, as you said, uh, General Weizmann, who is considered uh, one of the uh, founding fathers yeah. of the Air Force. He was in charge from 1958 to 66. But uh, the doctrine, of course, exactly. uh, and, and the prestige of the Air Force probably date from his time, also okay. his predecessors and successors. But he is considered uh, a very important mm -hmm. uh, man in the history. And following the Yom Kippur War, uh, General Benny Pellet. Uh, managed uh, to convince his superiors, both in the military and in the government, that the Air Force must look at its mission in a holistic way, which is what you talked about regarding the integration mm -hmm. of air defense with fighters and also air commandos and air intelligence and other assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Th this is it. This is, uh, and this is the idea. This is what is happening today. And even more than that, um, but yes, you know, this is it. What about the Navy? Is there uh, also um, integration with the Navy or at least with maritime assets? We have heard about, uh, most recently, about uh, some uh, air to, uh, or ground to air or surface to air, even if it's uh, a naval uh, surface mm -hmm. to air regarding the gas derricks uh, in the mm -hmm. Mediterranean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. The, the Navy have its own assets to defend the ships, but, it's ev but this thing is evolving in, in our time now, uh, so uh, to defend some assets uh, which are in the sea. Uh, it is already known that the Iron Dome is part of uh, the, uh, some of the ships today in the Navy. Of course, the air defense is uh, fully part of it. Uh, 
uh, basically the ones that are really, um, the ones that are shooting the, the, I would say, pushing the buttons over the our air defense people, which are integrated into those uh, ships. So yes, there is a... We will, we will go uh, into we Iron Dome uh, in our second uh, conversation, okay. but uh, as long as the maritime assets are close to the shore, they are still under the range of the coastal-based batteries, aren't they? Yes. And, uh, and, and this is, again, going back to, uh, uh, to, to the way that things were evolved. The, the defense today is what is called a multi-tier defense. And uh, we have a tier of uh, defending a uh, system on a different uh, ranges, different uh, uh, heights, and uh, so on. So part of this multi-defense layers are the ones that are defending also some assets on the sea. When did you decide to make the army or the military your career? That's a great question. Uh, I, I knew f from a young age that this is something appealing. Uh, but then I was just about to leave the military when I was around uh, 24 because I thought that I want to be a lawyer, which of course my mother was very happy of it. But then my commander uh, told me, well, you know, maybe you want to go to a course in the United States for six months, officer's advanced course uh, with the U.S. Army. It might be very interesting for you. And you'll go for six months and then you will sign for another two years. And, and that was basically the point that I, I said yes. And after two years, I, I thought that what I'm doing is very interesting, very important. Uh, I felt meaningful. And I said, this is what I want to do. So the important stage was between captain and major. Yes, exactly. There. And this is a lesson for young junior officers <laughs> um, to, uh, for the uh, next uh, generation. Yeah. Uh, Brigadier General uh, Deron Gavish, um, a very interesting uh, conversation, uh, Air you. Defense 101, and we will continue uh, in a second part. So for the time being, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and it's always a pleasure to, to see someone that is so knowledgeable about what happened, uh, you know, even when I was very young. So thank you for that. I'll ask the editors to cut uh, this part <laughs> out, and we'll see whether they obeyed. <laughs> okay.